So it's that time of year again. We all start getting ready to get our costumes together and you know things like that and take our uh, you know younger siblings to get <laughs> free candy from strangers. <laughs> Always pleasant. Um, I'd like to take the time to explore the origins of Halloween. Um, I did a little bit of digging and discovered that uh, our modern traditions come from four ancient holidays. Um, the first being Samhain, which was a Celtic festival. Um, the next is Feralia, which was a Roman festival. And then there's Pomona, which was another Roman festival. And finally, the Catholic All Souls Day and All Saints Day. So first we have the Pomona Festival. And here we see Pomona, the goddess. Um, she was a fertility goddess, and her symbol was the apple. Um, a lot of her traditions are based around her symbol, um, including bobbing for apples, which continues today. Um, the original tradition was that they would fill a basin with water and float apples across the top. And you would think of whoever it was that you wanted to marry, and you would try and get the apple. If you could get the apple, it meant that you could marry them. It was pretty simple, actually, back then. Um, another... <laughs> <laughs> um, another apple-based tradition that they used to do was they would peel the apple with a paring knife, and they would take the peel and throw it over their shoulder. And the initial that would form would be the first letter of the name of your future spouse. And you had to marry somebody with that initial. <laughs> um, the celebration was held on November 1st, uh, and for it they would help hold feasts, they would um, roast apples, nuts, and other concord fruits. Um, <clears throat> um, the final tradition of this that didn't end up carrying over into modern society is called burying your troubles. And what you would do was you and your lover would speak into halves of an apple and you would bury it in the ground. Um, supposedly, as the apple rotted, all of the problems in your relationship would fade away with the apple. Mm. Next, we have Feralia. Now, Feralia was a Roman feast which was held between the dates February 13th and until the 21st. Um, all the way throughout it, they would feast on various foods, including turkey and uh, <clears throat> potatoes and things like that. Uh, the festival was to celebrate your departed uh, relatives, but over time it eventually just became ce a celebration of the dead in general. Uh, people would gather together and tell stories about their departed family members and honor their memory. <clears throat> On the final day, they would all gather in a graveyard and they would place gifts on the headstones. Um, a lot of scholars claim that this led to modern day Dia de los Muertos, uh, the Spanish tradition. Hmm. Next, we have All Souls Day, All Saints Day. We have the cute Pope and Jesus. Um, <laughs> Now, um, All Saints Day, we'll start with that, uh, comes from the Catholic Christian tradition of honoring martyrs. Um, originally, each of the saints had their own special day, but over time there happened to become so many different <laughs> martyrs and saints that they decided to condense it into one day. Um, it was held on November, it's held on November 1st, and um, it's celebrated through feasting and uh, reflection on biblical texts. Um, now All Souls Day is the following day on November 2nd, and it's a little bit more solemn. Um, instead of celebrating the martyrs, you would mourn for them. Uh, both of these holidays serve to move Halloween away from its pagan origins. Now, why do we like Halloween to be spooky? <laughs> uh, this comes from Samhain, which was the original Celtic uh, celebration. Um, this, ho this holiday had the largest impact on modern Halloween. 
And, uh, hmm. all right. <laughs> so the, the Celts, they would um, hold large bonfires and they would feast around it. Um, they would throw the bones of the meals into the fire um, and that's actually where the name bonfire comes from. It originated as bone fire. Um, the Celts would dress in costumes to try and ward away the dead. Uh, they, the, this tradition led to modern day Halloween costumes. Now they would place offerings of food and drink on their doorsteps to appease spirits that might play tricks on the homes of the inhabitants. Um, this practice eventually led to modern-day trick-or-treating. <clears throat> so, the holiday rests in, <laughs> in pagan origins and was focused mainly on uh, the idea of witches. Um, the, the, the festival holders would be uh, elders in the tribe and we would consider them to be witches, based on their beliefs. Um, moving on is the origin of the jack-o'-lantern. Now this one has a little bit of controversy surrounding it. Um, a lot of people claim that uh, it originated as a part of Samhain, where people would uh, hollow out gourds and place candles inside for the dead to follow as they walk the earth. Um, but other sources claim that it comes from a Christian myth about a man named Stingy Jack and his dealings with the devil. Now the story is long, but suffice to say the man was clever and fooled the devil into doing various things. He eventually made the devil promise never to take his soul when he died. Um, when he finally did die, God would not let him in because of his tricks and gave him a lump of glowing coal before tossing him back into our world. He put the glowing coal inside of a hollow gourd and used it to light his way through the darkest parts of the earth. Um, in conclusion, uh, Halloween would not be what it is today without the influence of those four holidays. So, happy Halloween. Yeah, So Matt, what did you think? I thought it was good. Uh, I really like how he told and displayed the information. Uh, uh, I like the intro, how he um, how he kind of just said how we're going to start preparing for Halloween and introduced it to us. Uh, only thing was there wasn't really an overview of uh, the information he was going to give us. I really liked how he explained the culture, cultural traditions and kind of how it they slowly developed into what we celebrate today and how they all filter into it. Uh, also, like little beats, bits of information, like bonfire, how it, how we get bonfire, and yeah, I just I enjoyed listening to it. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's nice timing, of course. It's a good subject for this month, and so you you get the most out of that. I thought that that worked pretty well. Um, I your goal is is general, but it was clearly stated. I did hear a preview. What's a little awkward though is in the preview you have. Uh, the supporting points in a different organizational pattern than you actually present them in the speech. And that was a little awkward. I was wondering if you were going to get to Sandhain at all because that was the first one that you mentioned in the preview and then it doesn't come up at all. I thought, well, maybe I guess he just decided to skip that one. And then it turns out to be the last one that you really developed. So that was a little confusing. Uh, but you did a good job making transitions between the points primarily with the visuals helping along the way. It's clear that you're moving from point to point. Sometimes the movement feels sounds a little bit awkward when you listen back to it. Uh, when you finish a section, 
that's when you have a moment of uncertainty or you or you are not quite moving smoothly to the next point. Once you get there, it starts going smoothly again. I think you do a good job on that, but it does break up the rhythm a little bit in the presentation. So that will be something uh, that you can work on. Uh, it's you know organized topically by the uh, different uh, festivals or celebrations that are the origins of Halloween. I thought you did a good job uh, organizing it in a topical manner. The uh, supporting material needs to be cited. You've got a lot of information in the speech. I didn't hear any source citations, and that doesn't make any sense, because I know that you researched this someplace. You didn't pull out bone fire out of the top of your head, and you know, you're know you not making up stuff about the Roman festival, but you got that information from somewhere, and we ought to. it ought to be attributed someplace in the speech. It's gonna add to the credibility of your speech. And by the way, it might help you make some of those transitions occasionally, too. Uh, the visuals are fine. They, they don't add a lot of information to the speech, but they do make the speech interesting and relevant to uh, each section that you're talking about. They, like I said, they help with the transition. And there are a couple of things that work pretty well. The Pomona thing I thought was interesting with the apple bobbing. And of course, Sanheim at the end, you've got uh, some of the uh, traditions that are referred to. You've got multiple images on the one slide. It did seem a little bit like the last section when you're talking about the jack-o'-lanterns was its own little section. And uh, uh, so that's actually a fifth supporting point as opposed to being something that's integrated into the speech. And I'm not sure if that's just the nature of the subject or if that was uh, deliberately planned. Uh, the, it, you know, everybody's interested in the jack-o'-lanterns. Those are pretty elaborate ones, the Death Star and the Carousel or, you know. I love stuff like that. You know, it's, you know, it takes a lot of time to do those kinds of things, and it doesn't last long. It's art that it's like doing sandcastles. You know, it's uh, something that's great to look at for a day, and then tomorrow it's going to be gone. And that's the way those pumpkin art uh, can be. But it's nice to to see those sorts of things. Those are pretty elaborate. Uh, and of course, the first question that popped in my head is, uh, how long did it take you to do those? And <laughs> you probably didn't do them, did you? No. All right, and then, the, like I said, on the presentation, uh, when you watch it back, we're not emphasizing these kinds of things heavily on this go-round, although we want you to be aware of them and you'll want to notice it. You have a tendency to stand sideways talking to the screen in the first half of the speech. I think when you switch sides, you were a little bit more cognizant of the fact that the audience is out here and you directed your attention toward us a little bit more. You just need to get used to doing that more. I, I know. Part of what's going on is that you've got the notes in your hands, but you're also using the, the prompts of the visuals on the screen to help remind you what you're saying on those things. So the temptation is to constantly kind of look at the screen, uh, but that's, you know, that's not where your information is. Your information's in your head, uh, and you know, one reminder ought to be enough, and it's just a crutch that people go to sometimes. So you want to break yourself of that habit. All right, thank you.